But welcome back, I appreciate that. You had a 30 minute break and now we're back at it. And I'm sure we've all seen great ideas and innovative technologies fall flat or have some significant challenges upon implementation. And our next session will provide discussion and lessons learned on how to collaboratively and successfully implement new technologies. So please join me in welcoming to the stage the facilitator of this session, Chris Estes. He's the State Chief Information Officer for the State of North Carolina. successful was part of it. Yeah. Was that in the it's, script? It's, it successful? does say that. They wrote it in here. Oh, yeah. I we didn't prepare out, for the successful part. I took the other word out. Okay. All right. <laughs> so in our panelists, we have with us today Eric Ellis, Chief Technology Officer, Department of Environmental and Natural Resources, State of North Carolina, and the Director of the North Carolina Innovation Center. <laughs> Welcome, Eric. We also have Bill Oates, the Chief Information Officer for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And David Fletcher, Chief Technology Officer for the State of Utah. Please join us. Keep going there. Thank you. I'm Chris Estes from the state of North Carolina. It's good to be here today and see all of you today. Um, before we get going, I thought it'd be a little interesting to mix this up. I didn't really get this approved by NASIO, so Doug, if you're in the room, I apologize. But uh, part of being innovative and disruptive is to kind of mix things up. So uh, we're going to mix it up a little bit. Hey, the guys in the back, you have any good music, a little bump music? <laughs> Let's get some music going. All right, that's working, that's working. Now I'd like everybody to stand up. stand up. Let's all stand up, even up in the panel. All right, now we're gonna play still standing. All right, let's just see who's still standing. If you have a smartphone, you're still standing. If you don't, sit down. Okay, that's good. It's good to see we got a lot of people still standing. If you have Twitter on your phone, let's see if you're still standing. All right, we lost a few. Not too many, though. That's good. If you actually know how to use Twitter, you can stay standing. <laughs> All right, so here's the big deal. If you're still standing and you use Twitter, we're going to set a new NASIO record, and we're going to hashtag New Tech Rocks. So if you, go ahead and hashtag New Tech Rocks now. We're going to set a NASIO record kind of like for the most, uh, yeah, like hashtag beat. is the pound key for those that don't know. <laughs> I'm much better doing this when I'm just flipping my case. All right. New, new Tech no, Rocks, N-E-W-T-E-C-H-R-O-C-K-S. <laughs> All right. And if you've, once you've uh, tweet, tweeted that, you can sit down. We'll see how fast people can tweet. Yep. If, you, if you're not done, you got to stay standing. All right, so I think we're gonna get a new NASIO record on the number of uh, tweets, and that's what the panel wanted to do. We wanna make sure we set a record. This is gonna be a panel that rocks today. <laughs> All right, let's see. Thank you for the music, guys. That's really, that's really good. So to keep things mixed up a little bit, today's uh, session is the back room to board room, and for those of you, uh, we are using Prezi today, so if you haven't witnessed a Prezi presentation, we thought we'd mix it up even more, trying out some of our new technology. Sorry to my Microsoft friends. Uh, so uh, in, the, in your program book, you'll see that our new technology by nature is disruptive. Um, so we want to talk a little bit about that with the panel and talk about some of the new technologies that we think are going to disrupt the world that we're working in each day. So on our panel today, we have Eric Ellis. He's the CTO and the head of our Innovation Center, which, by the way, uh, won an award IT program of the year last night. Thank you, Eric. Good job. Um, also uh, won the recent Harvard Award uh, from the Ash Center uh, for uh, Bright Ideas in Government. So uh, good job, Eric. He's doing a lot of great things in North Carolina. Uh, Bill Oates is here with us today. You also see their Twitter handles, so make sure you uh, tweet about them and the great comments that they're making today. Uh, Bill is uh, the CIO from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and uh, leads all their innovation and technology efforts. 
And then from Utah, one of our leaders in, in uh, IT in the digital world is uh, David Fletcher. You'll see him active on Twitter, and uh, Utah uh, is doing a lot of great things on the websites. Uh, we're, we're trying to catch up with them, so I use them all the time when I'm talking about the General Assemblies, how great Utah is. So uh, great to have these guys on the panel today. So we're going to do an audience question, uh, if you get your little uh, responders out. Um, we're going to switch over the screen to the uh, polling, poll the audience. So uh, we're interested in, does, does your state have any IT innovation going on, whether you have a, uh, some kind of capability within your state? In North Carolina and a number of other states now are opening labs and centers. Uh, some have commis innovation commissions and boards, and then there might be some other things we're not aware of. So if you'll uh, go ahead and answer those. Got 10 seconds. No? Uh, use other if no. See the results here? Wow. Wow, a lot of others. Is the other mainly no's? Wow, that's sad. All right. Uh, so we'll switch back to the Prezi here. So, um, so much for that upbeat. in North Carolina, <laughs> we've uh, formed a partnership with uh, our, our vendor partners and our universities to create the uh, North Carolina Innovation Center. Uh, it was announced in November of 2013. Um, about half of the vendors that are sponsors here are active in our Innovation Center, so it would be remiss of me not to thank you. And the other half that are not involved, you're welcome to participate, call Eric. So <laughs> your phone will be ringing off the hook, Eric. Uh, we've since parlayed that as I'm the uh, chair of the Innovation Forum for NASIO, and all the uh, states are participating virtually in this uh, national innovation community. So we meet once a month and we're sharing best practices. We had some really good uh, insight uh, last month from Alaska on their uh, Lights Out Data Center. I found that very interesting. Uh, we're actually looking at doing something like that in North Carolina. I think uh, there were a couple other states that have done some Light Out Data Center, so that was really cool to, to hear. So. Uh, next month's call is coming up. We've got an agenda already scheduled. Who's, who's on the agenda? Uh, Georgia with responsive design. Georgia with the responsive website design. And we're going to have Kyle Snyder from uh, North Carolina NGAT with UAS. Yeah, so Kyle Snyder will be on the uh, call from our uh, unmanned air system project in North Carolina out of the University of North Carolina, uh, uh, NC State. Yes, sir. All right, so let's, uh, let's hop into it and let's hear what our panels are thinking. So we're going to start with our first question uh, to the panel. And this is for all three of you, so we'll kind of go down the road, start here with Eric. Uh, what new technologies are you seeing in the state government, and how do you think they will impact your state? So I wanted to uh, thank NASIO and you for holding a panel on this topic, because um, for the last year and a half to two years, we've been going at breakneck pace. And it's good to take a moment to kind of reflect on that question and be able to think, what, what have we been able to see in the last uh, year and a half to two years? Um, I've been able to also run into several of our business partners um, who have shared that technology with us. Again, I can't thank you enough. We wouldn't be as successful as we are without you. And our national innovation community members sharing and learning across the state, the, the nation has been very helpful. If I were to highlight a few key technologies that I believe are uh, non-traditional, I would say that 3D printing and 3D viewing actually come to mind. Um, I believe that uh, I've already started to see 3D printing impacting our state. Our science museums are printing um, objects for test and proof of concept there. 3D viewing is something I believe that we can explore over this next year. I'm looking into the potential of having Oculus Rift along with some 3D imagery, 3D buildings, so that could be uh, very telling. Uh, wearables and eye beacons and sensors. I, and I could go on and list these, and instead of just listing some of the technologies, I wanted to share a really quick story about um, iBeacon, because I believe it has a great potential in our state. iBeacon technology um, is beacon technology. Um, for those that you don't know, it's Bluetooth low energy, and it does what it says. It sends out a beacon. And as CTO of the Environment Natural Resources and some of the other attraction agencies, I see that impacting our state greatly in our museums, our aquariums, and our zoos. So kind of looking forward to some of those technologies. They seem small to start with, but I believe they're going to actually have some of the greatest impact to our state. Great. Bill? So I think it's uh, pretty fascinating when I think back of uh, my entry into uh, public sector, which was at the city of Boston. Uh, 
about eight years ago, eight and a half years ago. And uh, as we thought about the technology then, you know, we were really happy when we got GPS into the snow plow so we could start tracking them and we could start presenting that information to the public. We got really excited when we did a mobile app for constituent use that really was a new way to connect our constituency to city government and to also force performance improvements across all of our delivery areas. And we started playing around with 3D printing, uh, essentially creating kind of toys and trinkets and helping kids in schools learn about the potential of technology like that. But it's amazing as we sit here in 2015 and we start thinking about we have lots of progress to continue to go on mobility and cloud as we were talking about earlier today. But now when we start thinking about those same constituents, you know, now, you know, they're, uh, it's the devices they're carrying, it's the watches they're wearing, it's the clothes that they're wearing, it's the uh, uh, connected cars and autonomous vehicles that are, you know, on their way into our world. And as you think about, you think about drones, right? If you think about doing building inspections by using unmanned aerial devices, if you think about the impact these things can have on transportation, uh, on service delivery, uh, it really is taking a, us to the next level. And so while we're still learning about implementing those things that we've been talking about since we got here today, we're going to be hit with all these new technologies and have to figure out, as they were saying earlier, you know, where are we going to be in five years? So these things are going to come faster than we expected. Uh, they are going to require us to stay focused in a couple areas where we organizationally just have to get better, and that's in data and data management because there's tons of data that's going to come out of all this technology we're talking about and the security of that data and cybersecurity in general. So as we continue to improve our capacity in those areas, that's going to help us start assimilating these new technologies and, and really create government that can transform and leverage these technologies to the benefit of our constituents. So we've talked a lot about cloud in this conference, and, and really cloud now is a mature technology. It's part of what uh, we want to call the third platform, which is a platform for innovation. And I think uh, the more we have our arms around the components of this platform as states, the more we'll be able to, to leverage the innovation te innovative technologies of the future. And the four, four components of it are really uh, cloud, mobile, and uh, big data, and uh, social. So these are four developments that have been happening for a number of years now that, that create a platform that will enable us to launch all kinds of new and innovative uh, initiatives, I think. Uh, along with that, we're going to continue to see, I think, what I'm excited about is, is the advanced analytics uh, capabilities that are coming out in, uh, almost daily now. Uh, and uh, in conjunction with that, uh, artificial intelligence and how can we use that in conjunction with the data that we have, which is, uh, as state governments is, is voluminous and uh, probably more comprehensive than almost anybody else because of the breadth of, of services and things that we, that we deal with. Um, and, uh, and Bill mentioned uh, connected vehicles, the Internet of Things. Uh, how can we take advantage of, of an autonomous vehicles to provide safer uh, roads, uh, safer traffic? How are we going to play into that, uh, that environment? Uh, uh, developers are, are, are moving very quickly down that road, and state government has a role in, in regulating and ensuring safety in providing uh, data platforms that uh, that these vendors can take advantage of to, to improve life. Our, our chief of staff in Utah is, is blind, and she is as excited as anybody to, uh, to have an autonomous vehicle, a self-driving vehicle, so she can hardly wait uh, for that to happen. Uh, we've got new things that are coming at us. Our legislature this last year uh, um, proposed a bill on cryptocurrencies encouraging the state. They didn't pass this bill, but it was proposed, and, and it's going to come eventually, uh, uh, the use of cryptocurrencies. How are we going to deal with those kinds of things in, in the environments that we have? Um, machine to sh machine communications, and uh, 
And it goes on and on. Uh, drones and UAVs provide, uh, uh, are going to provide all kinds of data. Agricultural surveys uh, uh, is just one of thousands of applications that, that potentially will drive new data to state platforms. Okay, thanks. There's a great session on unmanned air systems later today, so make sure you're, you guys make yourself available for that. Does anybody besides me know what crypto what was it, <laughs> currency is? I, I have no idea what that is. Does anybody else uh, not know what that? Am I the only one in the room that know what cryptocurrency is? Cryptocurrency, Bitcoin. Oh, Bitcoin. Those okay. kind of uh, Got uh, it. currencies uh, that are electronic. I think uh, New Hampshire. If anybody here from New Hampshire had a bill uh, this year as well, so it's something that's in the future that we're going to have to look at. Got it. Thank you. All right, so let's uh, move on here. Let's take a more direct question. Eric, can you talk a little bit about how new technology has been adopted in your state? <clears throat> so uh, historically, uh, new technology has not been adopted very well in our state. <laughs> um, it, I've been around the state for about 10 years in state government. Uh, and it is in the past, pushing new technology is like beating your head up against the wall. Uh, fortunately, I have a, a, a thick skull. I think Chris would agree with me there. Yeah, I and, that. And, uh, and, but fortunately for our state, uh, we have new executive leadership with both a vision and support to create something like an innovation center. So if I were going to give a short answer on how we adopt technology in the state of North Carolina, I would have two words, innovation center. Um, and that's not the physical space. We are blessed to have 10,000 square feet of of high tech looking space because of our business partners, because of our relationships with, that Chris has with our secretary cabinet leaders. Um, but it's more the virtual component of it, trying to inspire that culture of innovation. And in, in doing that, I believe I could share one brief example that has occurred since new leadership's taken shape in, in North Carolina. And, and that example is in the past, a division director or an agency leader would have never called a CIO or a CTO and asked for their advice on, on how they ought to proceed with something. I had a, a director call me and ask a simple question, which is, which type of computer should I get for my field staff, the high-end computer or the low-end computer? Because that was our culture. And so I immediately started to respond, and I said, well, can you tell me a little bit more about your field staff? And she's like, no, no, just tell me which one. And, and so I was hard-headed, and, and, and together we decided the right thing to do was to put a survey out there and ask all the right questions. Does it need to be daylight readable? Does it need to be submersible? What, what type of conditions are your field staff in? Because we're in a new paradigm where we have tons of devices. Not everybody wants an 11-inch, not everybody wants a 7-inch phone either, but I do. Um, in doing that, we didn't just stop there. We went through and we actually brought the technology to them. We brought more than two dozen devices. 30 people were sent surveys. 30 people con uh, completed those surveys. 30 people were grateful that we were taking that type of time and attention. Th the outcome of that is uh, a seat at the table. In essence, this is one of the first examples I had of uh, IT being, instead of just in the back room, but actually being in the boardroom. And I believe that's the type of adoption we need in our state. Good, good story. Thanks. So, guys. can I just uh, add, add a little in. to uh, what Eric said? I mean, my one-word answer to the question is similar to Eric's. It's how do we adopt new technology painfully? That's how we do that. Uh, and I and it reminds me of uh, you know the conversations and the the presentation. I think it was Michelle Stacy uh, yesterday. Uh, talking about, it, this is not about new technologies, right? This is about culture, this is about leadership. I think this topic of from the back room to the boardroom, I mean, this is the critical piece that all of us need to think about. You know, uh, my experience uh, in, uh, in city government and then in state government is that the IT organizations really need to be front and center on all of these kinds of issues. And, you know, that can be painful. That does require you to bang your head against the wall. 
but as was said yesterday, you need to engage, right? The leadership of organizations like ours really need to engage, because that's the only way you're going to get your organization to engage and think differently. How are we going to be thinking about transforming our organizations? How are we going to be explaining to people why it's they need to be able to take some risk. We have to do things differently, or we're never going to be able to take advantage of the, the tools and the technologies that are available to us today and will be available to us tomorrow. When we think about you know, cloud, mobile, social, and big data, you know, we still have a long way to go to assimilate those things into our organization so that government can truly become the digital business that it needs to be. But it starts with us. It starts with leadership in IT. And, and, and what's the biggest thing we deal with, you know, across our organizations? Uh, you know, I always use the word insularity, right? Because that's what we face, right? We, and what is insularity, right? I never, I always just thought, well, it's kind of that closed minded I mean, what it really means, it's, it's just ignorance or lack of interest in ideas, cultures, or people that are outside one's own experience. Now, if you think about that, think about your own IT organization that could be insular in different parts. Think about your agencies that can be insular and very myopic about how they think about things. The only way to change that is to start breaking down bar barriers and breaking down walls. And I think that's what this is all about. So as we think about adopting new technologies in a state like Massachusetts, it really starts with developing a culture that is interested in doing things differently, that is curious about the new technologies. If you don't change that culture, you won't even find the new technologies. You will never be able to think about how could those technologies actually apply to the problems that you're trying to solve across your organization. When I was at the city of Boston, we had a really good compass. We had a mayor who was not a technology guy at all, but every time we would come to him with an issue, he would point us to, how does this benefit the people in my city? How does it make that neighborhood better? How does it make that single mother's life better? And it forced us to think about those things and to think about how we could take these, this new tool set that we have and how could we bring new solutions to government. In Boston, we started the Mayor's Office of New Urban Mechanics. And, and the great thing about the Office of New Urban Mechanics, it was that, that, that picture of coming out there with a new tool bag, right? With these new things that we had to offer, these new lightweight technologies that could engage citizens differently than we ever have done in the past. And the great things about office, innovation offices like that is that, you know, I left the city of Boston about 15 months ago to come up to the Commonwealth. The administration changed in the city of Boston, but one thing didn't change in the city of Boston. When there are issues that the administration is trying to deal with, when there are new opportunities, whether it's the, you know, ride-sharing companies coming in to try to figure out what licensure should look like in a city like that, the first place they go is to the Office of New Urban Mechanics, because that is now the front door to new ideas and to new innovations. And I think we all have that responsibility to carve out you know, that, that focus and that engagement to, with our organization to start thinking about what is the art of the possible with these new technologies that we'll talk about today. And we've done it by creating partnerships with the, uh, with the early stage entrepreneur competitions that are in Massachusetts, uh, with the associations of private sector companies in, in Massachusetts, uh, with academia across the state and beyond. And it's by breaking down those barriers and getting rid of that insularity that we now have the opportunity to bring these things and offer the value the same way our private sector peers can, but to do it in government as well. That's good, Bill. Thank you. So uh, yes, yeah, when Stu said we need to talk about successful projects, we actually talk about in our innovation center, fail fast and fail right. often. Right? We want to fail because that we know that if we fail early, then we won't do that again. <laughs> so, um, and we found a lot of our vendor partners, when they have to show their technology, it uh, sometimes fails and they're able to improve it and other times they're not, so we don't buy it. Uh, we change gears just a little bit here. Uh, Bill, uh, clearly uh, we deal a lot with regulation, so can you talk a little bit about some of the regulatory issues and standards that have been hurdles for you in, in, in your state? Well, I think that uh, you know, there's, there's broader process issues that I think we'll talk about later, and we talked about earlier today about policies and procurements and things like that that get in our way. Uh, but you know, I'll give you a couple examples of our attempts to uh, identify new technologies and where they might have value. 
And I mentioned uh, a minute ago that uh, one of the things that, that we did in, in my first year at the Commonwealth is we attached uh, to uh, a uh, competition called Mass Challenge. I don't know if anyone here has heard of Mass Challenge, but Mass Challenge is a, a, a world-renowned uh, uh, early stage company accelerator competition. Uh, and so they encourage early stage companies, so you can't have raised more than half a million dollars. Uh, you can't have revenues uh, even close to a million dollars. And they come to this competition uh, to get prize money, to get investment money from this mass challenge competition. They bring in 128 companies every year. Uh, so this was back in 2014. The 128 companies reflects Route 128, you know, the, the former high-tech capital of uh, uh, Massachusetts. Uh, and so what we did is uh, we looked at this competition because what I was trying to do is figure out how could we open the door to these new ideas and these new solutions that don't necessarily show up in our normal procurement practices. Uh, so we went and spoke with the folks at, at Mass Challenge. And uh, they uh, offered us an opportunity to do what they call a sidecar challenge. And so the sidecar challenge uh, was about civic innovation. So Mass IT, our organization, was going to sponsor a sidecar competition uh, for civic innovation. Uh, the good news about that is it forced us to think differently. And the value proposition here was that not only did it take 128 companies that were in a competition and force them to think about solutions in government, right? How could they take what they were probably building for a commercial sector and think about how that might apply to the issues that we're dealing with in government? And the other opportunity is it gave us a chance uh, from state government to get exposed to a bunch of companies and new ideas that we wouldn't normally do. We ended up uh, putting together a, uh, a, a $25,000 challenge. Uh, we identified two companies. One was in the uh, vehicle information space, and the other was in the security space. And our agreement was for the prize, we would do pilots in, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So what regulatory issues show up? Well, uh, when you're dealing with uh, information in vehicles, uh, we have all kinds of challenges in Massachusetts about uh, unions, uh, regulations around unions, and now we're going to, essentially the company is called Carno, and the device plugs into the, uh, the, uh, the maintenance port of, a, of an automobile and gathers that data, pulls it up into the cloud, and allows us to start analyzing lots of really interesting information that comes out of a vehicle. Uh, but, again, there's concerns there, right? So what happens, uh, our security standards jump right out to us. Uh, this is important information. What happens if somebody on the Internet side somehow makes its way into the vehicle and causes bad things to happen? So we had security issues. We had union issues. And the way that we deal with these things in Massachusetts is to bring these teams together, bring these interests together, and start negotiating small-scale pilots that don't offer the exposure that bigger implementations might, but do offer this opportunity to try something differently. So we end up putting some rings around those pilots to allow us to implement the technology and to see what value it has. And then, as Chris said, you know, learn quickly, fail fast if necessary, and then decide how we're going to scale it. Uh, the other product that we bought uh, was, uh, that we uh, awarded a prize to was in the security space. Uh, they were a company that works on spear phishing. So anybody who's had a phishing attack, you know, on the security side, what spear phishing in is very targeted attack where they essentially are, become imposters so that the email that you're getting looks like it's coming from someone in your organization. So they've created all kinds of algorithms and data analysis to make sure to start to figuring out who that imposter might be. On that front, we again started to deal with all the security issues and challenges that we have about how do you take small companies like this, how do you put them through the appropriate background checks, how do you do the things that you need to do, again, to try to get a small pilot up and running quickly without putting the burden and the weight of you know, Commonwealth regulations and processes on top of them. In both those cases, you know, we, again, through a very engaged leadership group in, in the uh, uh, Commonwealth, 
find ways to kind of drive this forward. It took a lot longer than we expected. We keep finding ways to streamline these processes, but they get in the way all the time. And as you think about things like, you know, autonomous cars and regulations that are going to come in from the, uh, you know, national, uh, the highway uh, administration, when you think about unmanned vehicles and what the FAA is getting involved in, as you think about the, the height of drone flights and uh, how close they can come to people and, and God knows, what do you do with all this data, right? How long can you hold on to it, these images that are getting collected around? So we have huge regulatory issues that we're going to face with all of these, uh, well, with at least a number of these technologies. And again, you have to have that spirit of collaboration and cooperation in your organization between procurement and legal and security to try to fight through these things and, and, and not allow them to become huge obstacles to even getting started with the new technologies. Okay, thanks, Bill. Uh, so let's, uh, let's go all the way over to the other side of the coast. It's funny you guys are sitting, we should have had y'all sit separate. But. <laughs> so what are we doing over in Utah now uh, on the same topic with regulations? Well, I think it's really critical that uh, we as technologists be prepared. And, and Bill talked about some of the use cases and there's real power and understanding what the use cases are and, uh, and being prepared with the response and developing uh, credibility with, uh, with, the, with the regulators that you're dealing with in all of these different areas so that you can show and demonstrate the value of these new technologies and show that, it, that, that it's worthwhile to the, to the point that some regulations may need, may need to be changed, may need to be updated. Uh, but that power is in the use case. So we need to understand uh, what can be done and uh, what the magnitude of the influence of this new technology is. So when we talk about big data, uh, Mark Van Orden, our CIO in Utah, has, uh, has really focused in on that and, and said, you know, there's going to be all kinds of issues in terms of, of getting to this goal of creating a, a, a statewide center of excellence and center for advanced analytics because of all the security and privacy issues associated with big data. Uh, so in order to get through that, we need to show the value of all of these individual uh, use cases for big data and show that it's worthwhile to do something uh, that is significant and that is large because this is really building a platform. Again, it's part of that, part of that overarching platform which builds towards our future. And uh, so when we deal with privacy, we can get through those things. We can, we can provide assurances that, uh, that we can uh, provide good privacy, good security, because we've developed credibility in those areas. And we can uh, show them that, uh, that uh, for example, uh, just a simple thing like uh, combating insurance fraud or, or or making significant gains in prison recidivism are going to be worth our time and effort to deal with these regulatory issues and challenges. Okay, thank you. So let's mix it up. Uh, Bill, you talked a little bit about uh, the security firm and the phishing attacks. Why don't you talk a little bit about uh, how cybersecurity is increasing uh, some of your mix? So again, I think uh, uh, cyber and data, right? If I could just think of two areas where we need to build expertise in our organizations that we have to partner with the right folks to get better at these things. It's, it's so critical to all of these things that we're doing. So if you, uh, in, in our world, uh, again, a lot of it involves partnerships and uh, collaboration. Uh, in Massachusetts, uh, we spend a ton of time uh, working across our partners in DHS, our partners in public safety, uh, to make sure that we have uh, people who are really good at watching networks and seeing these trends uh, be able to watch our networks and help us uh, see what's coming down the pipe in ways that we can't do this ourselves. We have constant conversations across Massachusetts uh, with all of these parties on how do we develop the expertise that we need. You know, do all of our organizations need to build our cyber talent individually or can we start grouping that together to make sure that we can plug into the expertise that we, we really need. I think as we think about new technologies and the explosion of data that's involved here, uh, cyber just 
becomes more and more important for us. The endpoints that we have, uh, the types of data that we're holding on to now, it changes dramatically. Uh, the, the, the profile of data that comes out of these new technologies is very different than the data that we're used to in our kind of big siloed systems approaches of the past. You now have data being generated by small devices, uh, data that's much easier to get to, that's much easier to publish, that's much easier to use. That's a good thing for us in some areas because we'll be able to use some of it as open data and it'll help generate new applications and new solutions. But we need to be able to control that because uh, the issue of privacy, if you think about you know, this dynamic that's going to go on for the next number of years, is how do we balance, you know, even on the commercial sector, service delivery, uh, you know, customized service for customers, uh, and, and the issue of privacy, that is an enormous issue. And government needs to think about how are we gonna, gonna play in this? How are we gonna balance kind of the privacy and the service delivery options that we're gonna have in front of us? So for us, uh, we need to rethink that cyber gets to be a little different over time. It's not all just about our subnets and our static IP addresses. It really is evolving to be much more data focused. You know, the convergence of what goes on in our developing data expertise and what goes on in our cyber world, those two worlds are coming together. And so we're spending a lot of time making sure that we understand what this cyber skill that we need, what it needs to look like a year from now and five years from now. So in addition to the partnership, there's the, the training opportunities. It's not all technology. You know, we need to think about how, how cyber also requires people with skill sets around human behavior and economics and other things as well. And so we're working hard on that to make sure that our curriculum, to make sure that our cyber skills are where they need to be for, you know, the decade, uh, is again a partnership with academia, a partnership with the private sector, a partnership with other kind of jurisdictions around the country so, to develop that skill set. Good, thank you, Bill. So let's partner with the audience now. Uh, so let's uh, get your uh, clickers out and let's uh, start ranking. Uh, I think we're going to rank these. A is the most. Uh, uh, a is the most. So you start rank them in order. You select the most important to you and then least important. So you would. Click the button that you think is most important first. Good tunes. Let's give it up for the guys in the back while you're voting. They're giving us some good music as we uh, sit up here. Thanks, guys. All right. Let's see what let's see what you guys said. Wow, pretty, pretty good even. distribution. That's probably one of the best distributions I've seen. So that'll be good. So um, Eric, why don't you talk a little bit about this distribution and how you see these uh, uh, technologies affecting the data in the state? So uh, right before I um, came in here, I saw a, a guy with a green shirt on and it said, I love data. I don't know who you are, but you're my hero for the day. Um, I immediately thought that I, I was underdressed, that he had outdone me. And um, like, like him, I think we all like data because of the insights that it can bring us, its impact to business. <clears throat> and I like new technology because it, it brings us new, new forms of data. And, and with that, undiscovered areas of insights that, that have future business potential. In, in thinking about data, the wearables, IoT, Beacon sensors, some of the things that we've heard up here. Um, it's obvious that it's increasing the volume of data. The, the lesser obvious story is that uh, that data is differing for organizations that have traditionally managed data in, in one one area or, or maybe the other. Uh, an example: organizations historically have either dealt with imagery or kind of log data. And now those organizations are being forced to deal with both of those at the same time. Uh, unmanned aerial systems is a great example. Um, as you're gathering imagery, which is uh, large format data, they're also capturing accelerometer information, GPS, et cetera. So being able to manage that and, and deal with uh, the synthesis, also the storage of that is a little bit different. 
our, our sensor data also compared to what we've captured when we're inputting data into something or we're creating a report. If, if I'm creating a report and, and my computer goes or, or I don't have a backup, well, that's just a bummer. If you lose log data from a pH sample from a couple of weeks ago, well, you can't get that back. And so a lot of our sensor data is like that. And so it, it's m even more critical that we, we ensure that and, and we manage that risk. Um, in North Carolina, our, our, our state has done something great in the last year, and, and I believe it is going to benefit our approach to data. We, we have our data analytics team that used to be in the controller's office. Mm -hmm. It's been moved under our IT organization. And so if I had to put my finger on one thing that's occurred, that would be it. Because that setting that leadership in the right place is the right decision for our state for a better approach to data. Good. Thanks, Eric. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, things that a lot of people in this room care about, procurement. So uh, David, let's, let's mix it up a little bit and let's hear from you about uh, how states uh, are going through the procurement process and how you pilot new technologies. Um, procurement process. Uh, that's back to the hardest thing that we have to do, right? Um, I think uh, working with vendors uh, is a process where we, you know, we're, we have to begin to develop some relationships in advance, but we also have to be careful about, uh, about favoring different vendors, and we have all these procurement processes built into place to be fair and, and equitable in, in the process, and that applies to advanced technologies as well. Um, but there are ways, I think, to procure advanced technologies that are a little different. Sometimes we can do a pilot. And uh, with, our, with our state procurement regulations, we have, we have some, some ways to procure technologies on, on a pilot basis or, or to uh, show a proof of concept. That, uh, that are helpful in terms of introducing technologies in, into, uh, into our environment. And I think we need to get adept at utilizing some of those techniques if we want to be able to demonstrate the value of these new, tech, uh, new technologies. We don't always have to start off with a full-blown procurement, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, do something that will grab the attention and also demonstrate the value of these technologies on a wider scale. So we need to be creative about the kinds of, of applications that we choose for this. Uh, sometimes we may want to do a sole source because we're, we're on a rapid time frame, but it, it can be done on, on this kind of a pilot basis uh, to introduce the technology without, uh, without tying us to a specific solution in the long run. I, I do think, uh, well, first of all, I give lots of credit to the folks in the state of Washington because to hear somebody talk about extreme procurement and an excited procurement team that's driving that kind of agenda forward is really music to the ears, I think, of any CIO. We work really hard at that in Massachusetts as well, working with our procurement teams. Uh, and, and, and so the way, the way we're trying to do this, again, we're, you know, we're, we have a very good relationship with procurement. We have found that, you know, some of the challenges that people felt they had uh, on procuring technologies quickly and maybe procuring new technologies weren't necessarily uh, prevented by our, our procurement rules, but had been kind of adopted culturally across the organization. And we have been finding that having some supporters in the procurement side allow us to push to do things like prototypes and pilots. We are also uh, creating new contract vehicles uh, that are different, you know, so someone I think talked earlier about categorization. Uh, we really do need to have categorization that can address some of these emerging technologies. These aren't contract platforms that can get negotiated and sit out there for three years without any ability to move things on and off it. We need a flexible uh, contract vehicle that allows us to find the new technology. So the challenge on IT organizations is to tell procurement what do you think you're going to need, right? That's the hard part because what it's changing so fast. So how do we provide them with enough information that lets them put those kind of 
flexible vehicles together that can then support our ability to go try something, prototype it, see how it works, see if it can solve some problems. Uh, but we're doing that, uh, uh, you know, successfully in the in the Commonwealth in a partnership with with procurement. We can always do it better. We still struggle, you know, with things that we, you know, talked about earlier with cloud procurements. Uh, you know, we still have a long way to go in a lot of these areas. But I think there is a real interest in building some vehicles that allow us to procure these things more effectively. Yeah, we in North Carolina we had the folk law. That, uh, yeah, right. that uh, it was hard to demo or test. So we actually introduced in our iCenter demo agreements, much like test driving a car, and we're able to get everybody on board with that. Our vendor community uh, has signed up demo agreements. We sign the demo agreements, and they leave the technology on site. We have about $6 million worth of technology on site from our business right. partners right now. That, uh, so the demo agreement became a real good tool for us. So uh, just transitioning back to our audience a little bit here, um, let's talk a little bit about where IT reports. As we, part of this session is about moving IT from the back room to the boardroom. So let's see how many of our IT executives are in the boardroom. Uh, so if you'll take a moment to vote, get some happening music going. Hopefully the governor see the light. All right, let's see what the results show. Ooh. Wow, that's, that's great. Uh, yeah. I think when we did this uh, uh, survey about a year or two years ago, it wasn't even that high. So that's, that's good to see. Um, about 40% of the CIOs still report to the CFO. So that's uh, pretty consistent with industry uh, coming from the private sector. That's, uh, we do see that. So it's good to, good to see the governors are standing up and taking a... One thing I would say to any of you folks that feel like you're more in the back room and because you're not in the boardroom of government, act like you're in the boardroom anyway. Yeah, Get them used advice. to it, right? I mean, seriously, I mean, I think the messaging that comes from IT organization needs to reflect that kind of peer view uh, that you should have with, you know, the cabinet peers that, that you exist with. Uh, repositioning IT is so critical to deal with any of the issues that we're talking about here. So, so even if you're not there, make them think you are. Okay, so let's, uh, let's go, uh, uh, David, let's talk a little bit about, I'm sure the people in this room that are here to support us in this conference would like to know how they can partner better with the states and bring their new technologies to bear. What, what advice would you give them? Yeah, uh, vendors are, are a great partner and they're critical because they have so many good ideas and how do we narrow those down and how do we identify the best ideas for new technologies that, that really have value for, for state government. And uh, we're doing a variety of things. Uh, coming up uh, in a few months, we're having a vendor day that's focused around big data. Uh, we want our agencies to really understand the value and all the different things that can be built on data, whether it's, uh, you know, the Internet of Things or, uh, or advanced analytics. Uh, so we're going to bring in, you know, uh, all of the vendors that we can, that we can find uh, that will come to our, our big data uh, event. We're requiring all of our IT directors across the state to be there. And then we're going to have a series of presentations and, and allow the vendors to really show off what they have to offer. Yeah, and uh, and it, it'll set the stage. We're also going to share that with uh, invited agency executives. So create some excitement uh, in conjunction and cooperation with the vendor community around specific goals and objectives that we have for new technologies. And. Uh, and we also have some really cool user groups going on in Utah. We have one, another one again uh, with advanced analytics and, and we worked with this uh, user group that included uh, uh, vendors and, and private parties, uh, researchers to create a big data competition around air quality, which is a challenge for Utah, especially in the, in the winter. And, uh, and they worked together to, uh, and created teams and training and, and, and really advanced uh, the progress of, of our understanding about what can happen with, with these uh, particular technologies. And that's something that can be done in, in any of these advanced technologies that we, we've talked about. Uh, really, partnering with vendors can help develop a better understanding of what, what can be accomplished with those technologies 
and uh, really what is possible. And it may be beyond anything that, uh, that we have already envisioned. And, and the help that we get from vendors helps us to create a better vision uh, for what we can do with technology. So I was just going to add that in, in North Carolina, when you, we have a thriving innovation center, um, we, we get that question a, a ton. How do we get things through the innovation center? Um, so the last several months we've been working on, um, I've been exploring idea management, ideation software, and also trying to uh, get a, uh, essentially a button on our website that allows our business partners to submit and propose ideas. Um, the, the, the fear there is that we're going to get a lot of ideas, so we, we will ask for patience um, as we try to figure out how to align that with our strategic plan. Um, but that is one way that we're going to hopefully do a better job at, at working with vendors. So uh, kind of building on that, Bill, how can we uh, foster the development of these new technologies within the states? So I think uh, uh, the, the discussion about you know, partnering uh, with our current partners to uh, make sure that we're understanding where they're going and how they might be able to, to bring some of these new technologies to the table is, is really important. But I think there's also the issue of the kind of entrepreneurial world out there that's thinking about things and that's trying these new technologies. And, and I think, uh, again, it's important for organizations like ours to understand what those uh, groups are looking for. In our world, what we have found is, in some cases, they're looking for funding. Uh, so we do something like that mass challenge where they can get some uh, prize money to kind of help move them in the right direction. For others, it's looking for space. space. So I give lots of credit to North Carolina for the Innovation Center. Uh, the space allowing collaboration to truly happen, to try new technologies, to have that environment where our users who are thinking about problems that they need to solve in their organizations, our IT people who are looking for the ways that they need to incorporate these new, new technologies into the enterprise that we already have, but they do need space. And in some cases, they're just looking for time and they're looking for commitment. So you have to have an organization that's willing to reach out and partner. Uh, we've had great success at uh, reaching out to the, uh, the civic entrepreneurs that are in the Boston area. Uh, our organization sponsors uh, uh, hackathons, codeathons. Uh, sometimes we'll start one and bring our data to the table and ask folks to help us think through it. In other cases, we'll just provide space or we'll work with academia to find interesting places where we can bring people together to move these ideas forward. So again, it's, it's getting out of that kind of mode of what IT organizations have become sometimes uh, in, in public sector and make sure that we're doing a lot of outreach. What I found when I came to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts is we did some really good stuff across our organization. And there were a lot of folks on the outside, the, uh, the tech sector ecosystem around New England. But there was kind of a barrier between the two. So all that great stuff that was happening out there wasn't necessarily finding its way you know, into the projects that were getting commissioned and funded within uh, government. So breaking down that wall and allow that information to pass through just requires a spirit of partnership. And a lot of the times it was our fault because we had nobody on our side that was thinking about those partnerships and how they needed to develop them. That belonged with economic development or that belonged in the governor's office. So changing that can have a huge difference. And it's, it's really led to some great successes for us over the last year and a half. Good, thank you, Bill. So uh, we're, we're nearing the end of our time. Um, I guess uh, one thought I'd give, I, I know many of you have mentioned to me that you travel to North Carolina to the Outer Banks, so thank you for spending your tourism dollars in North Carolina. Um, and while you're there, you're always welcome to come by and see our Innovation Center. It can make it part of a business trip. So uh, just let us know if you're in the state. Uh, we'll, we'll take care of you. Um, with that said, I'd like to thank our panelists uh, today. Let's uh, give it up for our panelists. Turn it back over to Stu. Let's hear it, everybody in the audience. Stu. Stu.